All right. Is this thing working? Is it on? Is it live? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, it's green. Yes. All right. Now I see myself. Hopefully I'm doing this right. It's been a minute since I've done it uh, live in here. Do you have a question, Kyle? Or? No. I'm oh, okay. Door. You, can, you can close the door. <laughs> Actually, I don't need my Bluetooth in anymore either. Hey, do I have audio? I see a hey. I just need to make sure I have audio. It looks like all the levels are moving, so I should be good. And we can actually start Vlog Thursday and all the fun that is the mess that I'm dealing with at the moment. <laughs> all right. So Vlog Thursday today is uh, going to be a little bit short because I have been absolutely busy and I didn't even close the window I'm working on right now, which is uh, how I make the thumbnails for Vlog Thursday in case you didn't know. Uh, if you, this is Steve's case, which I realize is actually a little bit dusty. And uh, okay, well, it's, it's got a weird request. All right, cool. Doing, doing some secure messaging with a friend. I thought it was an emergency because of the way he sent the message. So I have to rekey. If you're not familiar, I use yeah, uh, send anyway. There we go. Um, I use Signal for my messaging. And if you if anyone changes phones, Signal um, gives you a weird message uh, to let you know. They called it a safety number. So, anyways, I'm going to dig into the topics I actually wanted to talk about here in a second. All right, that's done. That's I have like uh, three screens in case you haven't seen my office before. So I've got my chat window over here where I'm talking with uh, you wonderful people. I have uh, Phil messaging me over on Signal because we're working on some projects together and uh, things like that. And somewhere I'm going to have another message pop up that says, check the NVR. I have everybody on site and doing stuff today. And I didn't feel like going in the other room. So I'm just going to sit here. We have been absolutely crazy today. I even started shooting a video and it never even got finished between meetings with clients and everything else. And I have to leave here in about 20 minutes because I'm going to do an on-site bid uh, for another site-to-site -site building. Um, we're actually bidding several site-to-site -site buildings. And one of the guys, because he met us from YouTube, will probably let us film all of it. Uh, so I'm excited if we can do that because we're going to connect like seven large buildings over multiple miles. Uh, we're detailing out the proposals for what needs to be done. Uh, but it's kind of, you know, kind of a fun project. So I'll be excited to work on that for sure. So, yeah. Uh... Oh, I need one more. We use groups. Uh, can I do... All right, let's see if that works. All right, so anyways, got my first unified device and built my own VM server. Thanks for all the help. Uh, point to point video, yes. I actually have a few point to point videos I filmed and have not uploaded because I haven't edited them yet. So until I edit them, we shall, um, uh, they are all sitting here. I have tons of video that I have. I have one I flew a drone over. We have a site to site that has a uh, series of cameras connected to it. That video, I really want to release it. I just got to just take the time to edit it all. So um, er, that's sometimes what I get caught up doing. But I want to talk about a couple things. And we're going to talk about VPNs for a second because that's been such a hot topic is... Uh, I can't take that call. So that one, I'm going to shut down. All right. There's a client, all those. Oddly, there's a kind of a stupid uh, problem when you use Google Hangouts, because I have Google Fi. If people call my cell phone number, I can't stop them from calling me. So it's kind of a weird problem I have. Anyways, VPNs, L2P VPN. Uh, so... I was just having a discussion with someone and I wanted to talk about this here. Oh, <laughs> the background of my thing, that's funny. So, open in. Which is right here, so, all right. This is a discussion I wanted to have because this causes a lot of confusion for people. Um, one of the reasons I recommend OpenVPN so much is because 
OpenVPN will cut through all the messes uh, of many uh, firewalls and multiple NATs and double NAT, triple NAT, and all the crazy things that you can uh, make a mess of with VPNs, you can cut through with OpenVPN. And let me kind of explain why. So when you look at all the ports, so here's here's some of the, um, so for PPTP, you need port 1723 used by T PPTP control, GRE value of uh, 47, L2P needs 500, 4500, um, ESP, and it also needs a GRE connection to get across. Then there's IPsec, same thing, there's a whole series of protocols. The advantage when you're using something like OpenVPN is you need a single port. And because it will run across a single port via UDP, it solves all these problems. And I get so many requests for people going, hey, let's do a video on this VPN, that VPN, because I can't make it work. I'm like, it, a video won't help you. The problem with a lot of these uh, not working has everything to do with the fact that uh, they don't work through certain firewalls. That is a big headache, especially the even the L2P ones. It turns out, I was on the phone with a guy, he's having problems. He can make it work at one location, but not another. He's got two ISPs. Uh, and it's not a problem at all with the Unify. It's the problem with the way the routing works with his uh, DSL provider. Their firewall simply blocks it, and there's nothing they can do. Now, the solution is to put the, fire, the firewall provided by the uh, DSL provider in bridge mode, but they don't support that either. And we deal with this. Uh, he doesn't have AT&T, but we deal with that AT&T here. Some of the craptastic AT&T DSLs that we see floating around don't support that. So it becomes this big headache. So this is one of those reasons why my go-to all the time is OpenVPN. One, it's easy to run, it's built into PFSense. Two, it just works. It has no problems. It just makes it really happy to do this. It cuts through the VPNs. So that's kind of my go-to solution. Now, the next question is, how do you configure Unify to work with OpenVPN? Well, as I understand, I think you can have some of the USGs do a VPN, but I know there's some, there, it's not ready for prime time in kind of my opinion. And the reason for that is uh, it, especially, I mean, they're nine, you know, they're like $99 like a USG. There's not a lot of horsepower in there. Open VPN is very processor intensive. So the other VPNs work really fast with low overhead on CPU because they're not trying to compress everything. The open VPN, because it compresses everything down to one tunnel, you're taking all the protocols, compressing them down to a single tunnel. That becomes a more processor intensive process. Therefore, it takes more processing power to achieve speed on there. So your devices that run OpenVPN at speed or at scale are gonna have to have more uh, horsepower, more processing power in order to get that done. So, but that's kind of, this This is one of those things that if you look through the comments on my YouTube and just emails that I reply to a lot, hey, I really want um, this to work, but it doesn't work unless I'm here and it doesn't work for this. These are all the problems you're gonna have, so. Yeah, these, uh, I want to cover that real quick. It is kind of an issue. The other one comes to the people who have emailed me and we don't mind, we can do these configurations, but you guys come up with some weird ways you want your firewalls set up. That's fine. And it's the way you want it set up in PFSense. Or uh, someone actually asked if they could do it in, let me find my PFSense lab machine. I'll fire it up because why not play with things while we're here? And it comes down to like selective routing with multiple ISPs. Yes. Hey, from North Indiana. So we got everything from South Africa from North Indiana. I love seeing the different names pop up over here. Uh, I'm in trouble getting OpenVPN to do local DNS Craig, in my network, so I only need to connect to a host name for a server remotely. I need the fully coordinate. Not sure if it's open. Um, well, we'll play with that in the lab here. We can probably pull that up. The um, what you're going to run into is using local DNS. I think you have to do an added push config to make that work in PFSense. So I'll wait till this boots up. Uh, you have to push the DNS settings over and across, and then you have to have a client that can accept a push uh, for that. Sometimes another option that you can do instead of doing a push across is you can go in and uh, just add a, um, 
you can add a DNS entry like in the host file, and then you can have those names resolve. So when you're connected, they resolve. That's kind of a cheat way to do it, but it works really well. Hey, Toledo, Ohio, Jay, nice and close. We got Norway, Sweden, Toledo, Netherlands, Canada. I got representation from everywhere. <laughs> so you can cheat by adding a host entry file that matches a local name, and that's kind of a workaround for that. Uh, VPN from hotels, switch to SSL VPN works perfect. Hotels are notorious for blocking, blocking VPN traffic. Yes, I have really been wanting to do a video soon. I wish it was native and I could do it inside of PFSense, but uh, to my knowledge, it's not. Maybe it's a future release. OpenVPN can be encapsulated inside of an HTTPS connection. So you can hide it as SSL traffic. Now, what that gives you the advantage of doing is when you take and encapsulate OpenVPN as standard SSL traffic over port 443, the only way it can be blocked at that point is by blocking all SSL traffic. Well, that pretty much breaks the internet right now in 2018 if you decide to block all SSL traffic. So uh, VPN encapsulation via that solves the problem. Now, let me actually, I'll pull up a project here and I can, I'll add it to, I think I can add it to the show notes. Streisand Effect VPN. Yes, Streisand Effect VPN. That's, uh, this is a deployment tool based on the Streisand Effect. And if you're not familiar with this, I don't know that I can leak it, but I can actually, I can do this. You guys can find it. It's on GitHub here. Easy to find, you just Google stray sand effect. And what this does is, um, this is really cool. This allows you to um, encapsulate everything and it has a multitude of VPNs. I've had some trouble playing with getting it set up. It's got like an automatic install script. My friend, it worked fine for him, didn't work for me. So the video I have doing it because I couldn't figure out why it didn't work. I had to scrap the videos. I had something else to go do. <laughs> so yes, this is different than configuring uh, port TCP 443. Now, let me explain why. Port 443 is an easy way to fool people. So I'm just going to put over 443 and it looks like traffic, right? Uh, no. OpenVPN, because of the protocols it uses, is not going to just automatically make the assumption. So if anyone's doing any type of deep packet inspection and they look at the transport layer of the packets, they're going to go, no, no, no. You're tra I see UDP streams in here that look like VPNs that will confuse people and, uh, well, it'll not confuse the DPI system. Maybe someone just sees the traffic, but anyone who's doing DPI, it's not gonna confuse them. What you have to do to actually get around it is you wrap it in a TCP 443 actual TLS connection. Once it's inside of a TLS connection, then inside of that, this is layering. So now the layer inside of that is OpenVPN. So it's using the TLS in there and <laughs> I like that someone appreciates the reference, but because it's wrapping and encapsulating, they can only see the outside layer. You're encrypting it again, so you're technically double encrypting, so there's that. Then the other side of it is the fact that it's sending it streamed over, boom, away you go. You have a nice solid VPN that's because it's using TLS over 443 as a transport layer, it's indistinguishable for any other web traffic. So really cool concept. And yeah, data inception. So <laughs> wrapping it in layers, you have a high level of security. Um, and also if, if you're using like a nice TLS 1.3 protocol um, as a transport layer and both ends support it, that much better because under TLS 1.3, you have a perfect forward secrecy set up. So now anyone who were able to obtain the keys later would not be able to decrypt all this. And uh, that just makes it awesome. <laughs> oh, you can't send money from, I don't know where you're at, uh, but, that's all right. You can always send it via PayPal. You can send it. There's different ways you can send money. So that's all all absolutely possible. Now I'm actually going to do something real quick here. I'm going to log into my firewall. Sorry, it's on the screen. You guys can't see. This is our primary firewall. I'm wondering about status of things. So one of the problems I've run into is I don't know why but for some reason, I want to see how the stream shows up. Okay, it's just the bandwidth the stream is using. I'm looking at my um, default and uh, I can show you guys this. Let me drag it over to the window in case you ever wondered. I've talked about this before. 
This is what it looks like for a live stream. I have people on the phone. So here how it's allocating some of the phone bandwidth over here for VoIP. <laughs> Western Union. Thank you, Matt Jake. Thank, thank you. I, I'm having trouble typing because I'm doing too many things. Um, what you're seeing here, because I'm on this interface, here's our VoIP queue. I can hear people on the phone in the other room. It's kind of faint, but I know they're on there and there's the VoIP traffic that's going. Um, this is what the queues look like. I do plan to do a video pretty soon on the uh, open, I'm sorry, not open, open VPN, but on the queues, how the traffic shaping works inside the firewalls and how that gets managed. So uh, that is definitely uh, on my to-do list, but it's actually pretty easy. The wizard in PFSense works amazing for setting this up. That way we don't uh, trump over our voice calls. We don't want the uh, the stream. I, you guys are important. I love the live stream, uh, but we want to make sure we have enough bandwidth allocated for uh, the VoIP. So right now it's limiting me, and uh, that's because we only were ah, there's a five meg upload, I think. And wait, no, we have a higher than that, but it's only uh, huh. This is our YouTube stream right now, and this is it says the stream health, even though we're uploading at about three or four megs. Uh, let's start by bandwidth. There we go. So even when we're doing the statistics by bandwidth here, it's kind of weird. It's uh, not, I don't know, three megs. It doesn't upload very much. I don't know why. Huh. I love them shows. Awesome. So, um, da -da -da -da. thank you on the MSP stuff. We're going to talk a little bit more about the MSP stuff eventually. I'm trying to put some more things together on that. No, it does not split automatically. I'm using... And let me go here to firewall. What's the queues? Hold on. Q VoIP, Q ACK. Ah, I'm using um, HFSC. So there is the bandwidth Q shaping that I have on there. I need to tune it because I actually have a um, kind of an issue where I need to change it between the LAN 2 and this. So that's another issue. That's I'll get into that when I dig into a video. So yeah, the, the Comcast kind of sticks us here. We have not the fastest they offer, but the fastest they offer before it, the pricing becomes unreasonable. So a little more bandwidth costs me more than triple what I pay now. So that's kind of my pain in the butt why I don't have even more. But strike sand effect here. Now let's talk about the firewall stuff. So let's log into my demo firewall. So let's uh, go here. And I'll talk about the other thing I wanted to talk about because this is just weird things. I don't know. And uh, people like to do weird stuff. I'm fine with that as long as you're paying. We can do weird things. <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah, smart Q saves the household. It's you, it's nice when you queue them up like that. So one of the things you can do when you're in that, and this doesn't get played with very often, and I've only done maybe one or two videos on this. What this is here is um, multiple outbound NATs. And this is something you can do inside of PFSense. So... Instead of the automatic, which is the default is way over here at automatic, we have it set to manual outbound. And I've done a video on this before. Now, this is where things get a little complicated. What the goal of this uh, was, and we have, let me kind of give you an idea of the sense. This is all obviously internal network numbers. Uh, this is not a public facing firewall. So the main WAN address of this is 150. We go over here, firewall uh, aliases, we have do we have another alias on this one? Yeah. Um, what I'm doing is creating rules. You can create rules in the firewall on the NAT side for the outbound NAT. And what these are is referred to as selective routing. So when you're adding rules, you can say interface WAN or interface LAN 2 or however you want to do it, protocol, the network, you can control what the outbound address, address is. And picture you have a firewall with multiple public IP addresses, or you have a firewall with multiple um, 
ISPs. You want some data to go over one ISP, you want the other data to go over to the other ISP. Well, in order to do that, that's where selective routing comes in. And this is some of those more complicated things. And someone asked me, and I guess it's possible to do um, with some of the edge routers as well, but it takes a lot of programming and you have to do it all from the command line by editing the JSON files and uh, doing that. So I'd actually had messaged someone and I can probably just pull the link up real quick. So I don't have to dig for it. Oh, that's a failover one. So it's not that one. So it's possible to do in some of the USGs, but you gotta remember that's a little bit trickier and people want something easier to manage. And this comes back to one of the reasons we kind of like PFSense. And this came up because um, we have a guy who's got uh, 14 public IPs, I think it was, and then a handful of servers. Some servers have to come out of some IPs, some have to come at the other because of uh, one IP got blacklisted, so we had to move his mail server to another IP. Uh, that kind of stuff becomes pretty easy because you can create a series of aliases and outbound rules. And that's what this does. I can say source, destination. So you can say, you can create a set of rules is now uh, SNAT. So the edge router equivalent, what you're trying to do is now SNAT. Okay, Willie. So you can, can you do it through the interface or can you, uh, do you have to do it inside of uh, the command line? You really want your firewall to be the edge device. You want it to be the edge. Want PFSense to be the edge device. We have Willie Howen here. If you haven't, uh, you probably know who Willie is. If you've ever looked up a Unify video, his name comes up way higher than mine. The guy is a genius at this stuff. <laughs> okay. So apparently on the edge router, they have more options in the GUI to do this. And I'm less an edge router expert, um, even though that's actually what I have at my house is an edge router that runs my house. It runs amazing, um, but I haven't, I don't have the need for this. And this is where people get weird. Um, the firewall problem I've had with a few people is People start to say, hey, I want to have one of my Chromecasts on one network uh, be able to pull from one location. Then I want the other Chromecast on my network to pull from the other. And what they're doing is they're trying to skirt the region issues. Um, and it's it becomes very tricky to do and manage. It's actually cool. I may have to dig into, and I'm sure Willie has a video on it, of how to do it with some of the edge routers. Uh, so that's kind of interesting that you can, I did not know it before this moment that you could do it with an edge router. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. The edge routers are, in edge routers and PFSense both, are when you get the um, more advanced networking things like this. Uh, the original person who had asked me about this wanted to do it just on a USG. And that's why I found the link. It's, yeah, this for a USG. I sent them. I'm like, eh, I don't think, I, maybe you could do this, uh, but you're going to be spending a lot of time, as in uh, Willie's comment here, USG equals JSON hell. And it becomes very difficult to manage all of that. So, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah, USG Pro handle multiple AN IPs. I, I'm, I can't wait. Now, this is this is something really good. I, I have a very positive view of all the Unify stuff. We love their equipment. We use a lot of their Wi-Fi. Um, and as they add more features, because it's softer to find networking, and because you're able to do this in a JSON file, that means eventually, and it just takes engineering and time, they will keep writing the web interface to be able to make this better. So that's one thing about it is uh, they keep improving it. And the even older versions, you know, hey, we added this feature, we added this feature. And it's kind of that they're adding features. Mostly they're adding them to the web interface. These features existed. You just didn't have as easy of access to them. Uh, so good news is it's generally been coming with some of the uh, Unify stuff. They've, you know, over the years, we've seen gr dramatic improvements in our firewalls. I know they're working diligently at it. Uh, but firewall engineering, you want people to be slow and careful, not uh, fast and loose because this is firewalls. This is <laughs> really important stuff. And uh, yeah, so just keep that in mind. They are coming with some of these, but if you have these weird things you want to do, you can do it. Now, another thing, and this comes down to, and maybe the, maybe me and Willie will do a, uh, a, a fun face-off of what, who can do what and what systems. <laughs> Cause I'm, like I said, I've just 
for, for being a PF Sense user for a long time, that's one of the reasons I dive into this a lot. Um, but one of the cool things you can do, and I have a video on, uh, but I'm going to do an up updated one with the new version of PF Sense because the new version is getting close to release, the 244 uh, version. Uh, selective routing with VPNs. So if you use PF Sense to use someone like PIA VPN, you can then uh, say selectively sending network traffic over the open VPN versus out of your ISP. Now, the easy answer is you could just say send everything over the open uh, over the VPN through a VPN provider. But that being said, there comes at a, an expense of speed because you're double encapsulating everything, so you're adding a little bit of latency. You, then there's also just limits on the speeds of VPNs. Uh, so you may only want because you're trying to region code or whatever the reason you want to hide certain traffic, you can do that. So. I have a server behind a net. First router is from the ISP. Second is from PFSense. Do I need to set up something special to make it work? No, you're just double natting at that point. So you don't really need anything special. And best practice for hardware set up for a virtualized PFSense. I mean, do I have the PC uh, at the incoming internet connection or could I have it anywhere in the network? And do I need pass through? So in order to make uh, PFSense work, virtualized. It's not how I would prefer to run it. I like it to run on um, actual hardware, especially because one of the things that you will probably run into, and let me see if this is an issue in here. This firewall does not have any uh, have any interfaces assigned that are capable of alt Q traffic shaping. This is actually a feature that PF Sense works really well. So let's say, and I prefer um, with PF Sense is like those four port Intel cards. I've done this in my getting started with PF Sense. You, the Alt Q, the more advanced traffic shaping options are not available because it's a virtualized version of the hardware and it doesn't have all the right features. Versus when PF Sense sends the command for the traffic shaping, it's doing it at the chip level on the card. So the card has control registers that allow for traffic shaping. So PFSense simply offloads that and those chips are dedicated chips made for traffic shaping so they handle it very well versus when you run it in a virtualized environment, this is one of the problems that you can run into right here. Uh, so that being said, there's one issue. The other thing is your interfaces. So Let's say I want to plug my cable modem in, and here's my lab system here. So you would take like your virtualization system, in this case, Zen server for me, XCPNG, and then you would take a network card, plug it in directly to a bridge cable modem, and then attach that network interface over to the PF Sense. So that's kind of how you would get that on there. I can't remember if I did a video on that. I think I did once, but it's kind of different. So yeah. Desk. Now that's another option uh, right here. Hardware pass through. If you take and pass the hardware directly through, is sometimes referred to as PCIe pass through. It is supported in Zen Server, not natively through the interface. When you forward the hardware through, that's how you solve the problem as well. So if you're doing hardware pass through, you can even pop another network card in your virtualization server and then forward it through through hardware pass through, and that solves that problem as well. Is there a difference between using onboard NICs versus Intel NIC cards for PFSense? It really depends which, which onboard NIC there is. For example, if you have a onboard Intel NIC, no difference. And as long as the drivers are well supported, great. And it this is this is the tricky part. You have to just go look them up and there's plenty of documentations on hardware that works. And you can like type in, you know, PFSense or even FreeBSD and look at supported network cards and go from there. That will help you out with finding which ones you can use and which ones are well supported. So as long as it's a well supported one and their their support is broad. It's very there's a lot of them out there. I just like the fact that you can pick up, if you're doing a home build, you can pick up these four port Intel ones for like 50 bucks on the internet. They're not expensive. And it gives you four logical ports uh, for setting this up. So it's very reasonable. Uh, yeah, this is all. Uh, what NICs are in the NetGate devices? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I'll log into it. I think I think NetGate because they, uh, I believe they have all Intel's in there. I will actually log in to one and look, but I'm almost. You know what? I already can tell you that they're going to be Intel, and the reason I know that is because they use all those Intel system on a chips. 
So I believe everything NetGate uses is all Intel. Uh, but NetGate, because they're specking out the board, they are very specific on which parts they choose on there. Um, if you dig into the, actually, the more interesting device to me is like the SG3100 because uh, it's based on ARM. So it's, I believe also has, I took it apart and I covered it in my video <laughs> what chips are on there. Uh, that's one of the reasons I took it apart. So, all right, what else was I gonna talk about? So that's the multi-routing, uh, multiple outbound routing, blah, 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 fun stuff. 243 Reese Plea 1, we're gonna go to 244 here. Um, FreeNAS, let's talk about that. So that comes up a lot. And I did the performance testing on there and I think some people were surprised because I only have 16 gigs of RAM in my FreeNAS. And I'm like telling people, you even with 16 gigs, yeah, I don't have the caching performance because I only have 16 gigs, but I'm getting near SSD speeds out of my iSCSI connection and four hard drives that are spinning. So that's one of those things. But that being said, I just sent over a quote because someone wants to build us to build them a free NAS machine. I'm fine with it, except the problem is they want to run a whole bunch of VMs and use it as a giant hypervisor and do all these fun things. And I'm like, nope, that doesn't work very well. That's something with FreeNAS. They are getting better with the Beehive VM. But for example, like we were just talking about hardware pass-through that's supported in other hypervisors, um, you that I know of right now, I think Beehive has no hardware pass-through. And inside of FreeNAS, it's even more limited. Matter of fact, FreeNAS, some of it has to be managed from the command line because it's missing uh, stuff. And I know some people have complained, they call it kind of a beta feature. It is a little bit of a beta feature. They've created the VM system because there's enough market demand for it, but there's not been enough commercial demand for them to really push into creating uh, a FreeNAS hypervisor system that's amazing. It's gonna be a slow go, and it's also based on the FreeBSD and Beehive, so it's not as popular, so there's not as many developers on it. So, yeah, that's there. Um, if they want a ton of VMs uh, along with the file server, yeah. Unraid's actually a choice a lot of people do. Unraid, there's um, hardware pass-through and everything else. I'm not as big of a fan of Unraid. It doesn't use um, ZFS. It's not open source. So those two things are generally why I shy away from it, but um, have at it, it's a good product. But when you get into the commercial and enterprise, we're seeing more and more um, things moved over to uh, the FreeNAS because most people want separate servers. You have a separate storage server and a separate VM server. So, <clears throat> but with that being said, FreeNAS is actually moving to newer versions because they're gonna, they moved over to IO Cage with 11.2 and now Hey, can I run FreeNAS on top of my Unraid with pass-through? You could. That would seem weird, but I, yeah. <laughs> FreeNAS really should um, be run on bare metal hardware. And because they moved over to IO Cage for their uh, their jails, they're going to improve a lot with how the functionality that you have in there. So we should start seeing even better support and more speed for a lot more things running in there with the new IO cage setup, which is nice because instead of of course running a VM, which is big and heavy because you gotta you gotta virtualize an entire OS, instead of virtualizing the OS, jails allow you to very lightly and thin run run things in there. And I we're not I didn't switch, I did think about it. We're still running here FreeNAS, um, the stable version uh, U5, uh, yeah, 11.1 .1 U5. I have considered um, the beta. So far, we've been playing with the beta on another machine. It works really well. I've been happy with it, but I'm probably gonna wait till beta two gets released before we move to it. I I, I wanna test with a production machine that we have here, so. <laughs> out from the end. It out from. Uh... Proxmox passes through this to FreeNAS, and nice because he back to Proxmox for VM storage. Yeah, you can come up with weird ways it might work. Um, I know that FreeBSD, FreeNAS, ZFS, they they work so well together, and as a storage server, it's outstanding. So we have worked with companies and deployed the TrueNAS, their commercial enterprise version of this, um, and it just works awesome. Yeah, you can run a free NAS with iSCSI for EMs. That's literally what I'm doing. So if we go over here to my services, right here's my uh, iSCSI. So we're gonna go ahead and configure. But yeah, this is our um, 
This is the Zen server, LUN ID of three, because I got rid of some of the other ones. And that's pointed right here called production VMs. And when you go here to storages, there's the thoroughput on here. And I did this before I've run some tests and no, you can run VNAS for iSCSI storage. I just don't like running the VMs, the VM itself over here. Please note the lack of VMs in my FreeNAS machine. <laughs> FreeNAS is my storage server for my XCPNG system right here. So here's the FreeNAS production eval, and it's connected to this. So it is an iSCSI, oops. This is an iSCSI setup with connected to FreeNAS. So my Zen server connects to my FreeNAS box. That's how that works. And it's connected via 10 gigabit. So I get all the benefits on the back end of this and which and actually you can probably pull it up. I don't think it breaks anything to show you. Services, I, I'm gonna do some iSCSI tutorials as well with the new version. As I know, there seems to be some questions about how iSCSI works. There we go. So I know it's small and I don't have a screen magnifier. Dev, Zval Zen Storage Production VMs. So here's a Zval called Production VM. And here is where that is, Production VMs. And you can see how I have it allocated. So what you have here is my uh, Dell R10 with a 10 gigabit card going to a FreeNAS backend and it's a Zval pointed at iSCSI. I've got a new video I'm gonna be doing on that so I can walk you through how all that works, but I will tell you, it works great. Now, for those of you that, uh, if you're talking, I see a couple people mention ESX there. If you wanna use ESX, trust me, VM, the VMware platform, iSCSI, FreeNAS works great. You can, you have all the options in there for it. Matter of fact, one of the things they have is they support VMware snapshotting in here as well. I've never used it, I'm not much of a VMware person, uh, but it's it's VMware certified. I believe they have all the certification from VMware and all the support from them. So if you are using ESX servers, you can absolutely use FreeNAS as a backend storage. And matter of fact, it is a very frequent, I've talked to the FreeNAS engineers, they have a ton of deployments. Um, it's a really popular storage server for VMware. It's very, very uh, popular, so. Evernote alternative? Um, no. I, I'm gonna do some more playing with Nextcloud. So Nextcloud might be the suggestion, but I don't really have uh, a specific alter. I never used Evernote. I just use Google Keep. I know it's not open source, but it's really, really convenient. So I, I've used it for a long time. So um, I wanna do some Nextcloud testing. That's gonna be there. 4K HDPR, no, nope. No, not 4K HDR, I haven't built any, not played with any either. Yeah, Nextcloud's gotten amazing. I've used it a long time ago, uh, back when it was own cloud, back before the fork. Um, and Nextcloud, it's on my to-do list because I'm gonna build it inside of FreeNAS. I may build an independent machine, but I may build one in FreeNAS as well. So uh, that's on my to-do list to be playing with that. Nextcloud is, they've come so far with the project. Um, one of my problems is I, I, I like to use stuff if I go through the trouble of building it. And because we already pay for Google, I'm not likely to use it very much. It's gonna be a video I do. I don't know how much use case I'll get out of it. Uh, and for those of you wondering why I pay for Google, and this has been a debate, people email me whenever I say this, oh, running a mail server is just no problem, Tom. No, there's issues running a mail server. Um, Google handles, and not that spam is horrible, they handle all the spam control. The biggest thing I had and what got me off of uh, having my own mail server is staying off the damn blacklist is like a full-time job. Google never gets on blacklist, ever. I can email people all day long, the emails don't bounce, people get my emails. I had business it cost me not being able to get emails out to people and having to do phone calls. And that's embarrassing as an IT company because for some reason I got caught up in a Barracuda spam filter and could never figure out why. And eventually they removed it after two days. Well, by then I've lost two days of me not being able to send email to anyone who was using this. And that was a number of years ago when Barracuda was probably even more popular. The market's more segmented now. So I just got off of it, it just, when I send an email with with uh, Google, I know it's getting to the person. It's consistent, it works. 
it's unfortunate. I ran a mail server for years. I hosted all my own mail for years. I did it for other companies. I managed it all. I got out of the mail servicing business. It's just a nightmare. And it's getting the email out. Receiving emails is fine. There's some things you should do to, to prevent spam, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, so... Uh, yeah, Google Keep is one of, it's hard to get away from Google Keep because it works so well. And because, like I said, I pay for the Google services, we pay for the Google suite, we just use the hell out of it. So, but I really got to wrap this up because I got to go do my bid. I'm um, running late now because I just looked at the time and it's later than I thought it was. <laughs> so, yeah. Next Cloud and Own Cloud are, are both, I mean, Next Cloud is just, they have so many features they're adding. If it wasn't for the email problem, and it's one of those things, if I'm paying Google for all the other stuff, I may as well use the things that are included in their services. It's hard to de-Googlefy yourself. It's not easy. It's not that I don't want to. Um, I don't know. I'll, maybe I'll work on de-Googling myself. Then I feel bad. I wish This is something I wish Google would do. So how about Google gives me just email for, I don't know, half price, and I don't get their other services? There's a thought. Uh, I don't use your other services, Google. I just really need to, my emails not to get bounced and <laughs> uh, do your bid on live stream. Yeah, I wish I could. I can't take the computer with me there. Uh, maybe I'll record some of it. I don't know. I, I'm personal friends with the person doing it, so he'll forgive me if I'm a little late because I'm going to give him a killer deal on all this. Uh, cool. Yeah, it's now from a cost standpoint, I have hosting stuff I'm doing anyway, so it's very little extra cost. And you can always spin it up in some, you know, DigitalOcean or Linode for five bucks a month. You could have some storage, but that does become an issue. Email, um, I like to keep all my email. Matter of fact, at the moment, I'm not going to show you my inbox. Sorry for those wondering. Um, I've got 101,382 emails. And a lot of them have attachments because I never delete emails and Google doesn't require that I delete emails. So I like to keep all of them on there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Underrated. Yes, I appreciate it. Um, it takes time to build a channel. I am very conscious of that. And I like doing um, deeper dives. And in case you guys didn't notice, I mean, I love doing deeper technical dives and stuff. And I plan to keep working up towards more videos on that because I think um, providing a lot of mass amount of network knowledge, I want to be able to make it easy for people to get some of this knowledge, get at this so they can get started on some of this. And of course, I'm a huge open source advocate for in case you are a first time visitor here. Um, so there's always a there's always a leaning towards open source with the way we do everything. This is why I do the open source videos on everything from our platform to everything. And it's also the concept of my company of being very open about how my companies run, what we're doing and things like that. I like transparency, it's kind of interesting. I like when people share what they're doing and it becomes, you know, a lot of fun. But I gotta run um, and go do the thing that pays me some of my bills. <laughs> <laughs> so I can keep doing YouTube stuff because trust me. I mean, I love you guys. I like that I get some money off this, but it's uh, hard to pay the bills with just the YouTube. The ad revenue goes like this. Sometimes it's like, hey, look, I got ad revenue. Then it's like, <laughs> yeah, screw you. We're not giving you any money this month. <laughs> All right. Take care.